Welcome to my last part in analyzing the Dungeon Dudes mechanical content for classes and subclasses in their book, Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim. Uh, this final part, I wanted to look back and really when I started this project, I, I wanted to get a good idea of what lessons of design can we learn by looking at existing design. When we look at particularly official, officially released 5e content and we compare it to homebrew, third-party resources, what are some of the trends that we see? What are some of the ways to build a subclass, a class? What are we trying to accomplish? And how do we know when we've succeeded or when we failed? And this Serpent Monk subclass is one where I really want to pick it apart, not just as far as looking at the mechanics themselves and saying, here's what I would have done better. I want to start look at looking at the design process itself. And so to look at that, we're going to start by saying, what is our starting point for subclass design? I think the most traditional starting point for subclass design is starting from a concept. I think of a character and I think of a way that a character that hasn't really been represented in D&D &D so far, but I'd like to represent it in D&D. &D, and I'm sure I can come up with some mechanics to represent it. But I, I'm thinking of my character, I'm thinking of what kind of stuff they can do, what kind of weapons they might use, what kind of abilities they might have. Uh, and I kind of imagine them in a fictional space performing those abilities. What do they look like? And so oftentimes we'll start with an example from fiction. So in fiction you might say, oh, think of the time that there was a... Uh, I was watching a, 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 a show where a, a person had the ability to eat anything. And you're like, oh, how would that, how would that translate to a subclass? Or maybe you're playing a game where the it has a special class, like maybe an engineer class. And you're like, oh, how would I do an engineer in D&D? What kind of abilities might they have? And then once you have the idea of what the concept is in your head, then you think of mechanics that map onto the concepts. Um, another way you could start is start from mechanics. So you can look at a mechanic from the game, from 5e, and start to make something that you find interesting. Oftentimes this might start with the idea of uh, one, one thing that's been kind of recent, we see it in t Tasha's, is the idea of pet subclasses. So once you have the idea of this is a pet that uses a bonus action, that's going to use your bonus action, and it's going to attack every turn, and it's going to have some kind of special ability. Once you start coming up with that, you start saying, oh, what are some of the classes that don't really use their bonus actions that much? And how can I start to build something that makes, build a pet that makes the class more interesting, makes for an interesting subclass. And you start to map concepts onto those mechanics. So you might say, uh, oh, I have a fighter who I want to have make a re lot of reactions. And so then you say, well, what kind of flavor might that be? Well, that might be a very alert fighter. So uh, oh, maybe a speedster, maybe he's a really fast fighter. So he's kind of more like the Flash or, or a lot like you know, some, something something to that effect. And then there's also the mixed approach, where, of course, you start from a concept, and then you start getting some mechanics that you map onto that concept, and that informs more of the concept, and vice versa, or opposite, and likewise going vice versa. So I wanted to pick out some examples from Tasha's, uh, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. So one we might look at is the Wildfire Druid. Now, I don't think there's a lot of existing characters in fiction where they are a druid, a nature-based thing that is also very interested in wildfire and rebirth. Certainly that's probably something that we've heard in fire management, especially in the United States. There's uh, large portions of the western part of this country that uh, fires are a very important part of the life cycle of forests. So that maybe has some bearing on it, but as far as characters that have a fiery companion that... Um, that, that, that follows them around and, and, and is helpful. None really come to mind, but at the same time, uh, the, mecha the, the mechanic itself is very distinctive. You start with a pet subclass, and it's going to be able to do something cool, and then you can say, well, what, what would be kind of cool that we could have it do? What about teleport? And you're like, oh, okay, can it teleport? And it can deal fire damage that, to whoever left behind, and then teleport itself and... Um, the druid over, and then they might add in. Oh, maybe it would be cooler if there were if, if it could mul teleport multiple people because you don't want to, you know, uh, deal damage to a fellow party member that that you leave behind potentially. So maybe the fellow party member comes with it, and so you start you're working from the mechanics, and then you can kind of build the flavor onto it. Where then you say, 
this is a wildfire spirit, it is fiery and foresty, and so you end up with something where the concept itself maybe isn't the coolest, maybe isn't the most solid, but the mechanics are really cool, and they excite players where they're like, oh, I want to play and try this mechanic. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the Soul Knife Rogue, where you'd say, oh, I want a Psychic Rogue. You know, a lot of D&D in the past, um, um, however long it's been, in the past, what, 30 years, 40 years, um, has we've, we've used psionics, we've used all this stuff, and uh, mind powers, and it would be really cool on a rogue, you know, and so, okay, and then you start to look at mechanics, like what does that entail? Well, maybe it's got one where it boosts your skills, because rogues are good at skills, but now you can use your, oh, you can use your psychic abilities to boost skills, and you can just kind of flavor that, you can just be like, oh, whenever you make a, a check, you can use your psychic power, and that's going to give you a boost to that skill, and you can kind of think of it as like, imagine uh, a, a rogue who's picking a lock, and they're like, oh, I just can't get that last tumbler in the lock. And then you just use your psychic power and you just doink it and the tumbler falls. And, and you and the lock clicks and opens. And that's that's a cool concept that you can then make and map uh, mechanical powers onto it. Uh, while somewhere in the middle, you end up with something like the Mercy Monk, where you're like, oh, a monk that heals and harms. We can imagine a, an unarmed combatant being both a battle medic and uh, having expertise in the human body. Uh, you, you can heal your friends and uh, destroy your opponents. And uh, I think in that case, it was a case of uh, somewhere in the middle where things kept informing back upon one another. They thought of mechanics that could boost the monk, but they also thought of, well, what's something unique that, um, that this character concept would deliver on? What, what, what are kind of the things that I can imagine the character doing? So now that I've kind of laid that out, we're going to take a look at the Serpent Monk. And I want you to think to yourself, what is the subclass? How did they make it? Did they start from the concept and then build some mechanics onto it? Or did they start from the mechanics and then build the, uh, and then build the um, uh, concept onto it? Because there's a couple things here. For instance, we have a snake theme for a Spear Monk. And when you step back and you're like, well, maybe that's not super common in fiction that that is a little weird maybe they came up first with the idea of a polearm using monk and then they mapped the snakes onto it um or maybe it's the opposite where they, they had some examples in fiction of some snaky monks that they wanted to capture and they're like oh um oh i've seen this this snake-like uh, lightly armored very mobile spear user I've got it, uh, something, uh, a spear-using monk, and then you start to do that. And I think once we start digging into this subclass design, we are going to start to reveal the answer pretty quickly. Now, I'm going to tip my hand here. I am cheating a little bit. So um, uh, I think it's pretty obvious that they got the concept first. So we see Oberyn Martell. He's known in the book of Game of Thrones as the Red Viper, and his daughters are called the Sand Snakes. And specifically, he is a lightly armed, very nimble, very quick, uh, spear user who's going to do a lot of twirls, do a lot of spinning around, and uh, you kind of got that monk flavor. And in a similar vein, Darkest Dungeon, a video game that the dudes have been uh, very open about enjoying, has the character of Shieldbreaker, who is a spear using, lightly armored, um, moves around a lot, uh, very nimble, um, and kind of has a lot of uh, debuff abilities. That you could maybe see, you could maybe map onto a monk and spear wielding martial arts appears in all kinds of cultures, particularly uh, East, East Asia, um, but you know uh, particularly spear, spear, spear wielding, um, lightly armored people do do appear all over. So um, I, I think this is a good concept to start to capture. Now we're going to look at how did they? So if they had the concept first, what kind of mechanics did they then map onto that? So the first thing is we're going to allow the use of reach weapons. You know, perfect. We're at pole arms, so they're going to get reach weapons. And as we all know, reach is a beneficial property that some weapons have. But maybe we didn't think it all the way through uh, when we designed the subclass. And so uh, that's that's where we start with the concept, and maybe the mechanics don't really work. As same with the jump, we can imagine them pole vaulting and stuff like that. So yeah, we'll give them a jump bonus. But maybe we didn't think it exactly through, and maybe the boost isn't as much as it should be. Uh, we're going to see some mechanical combat upgrades, more attacks, fewer key spent. But have we built a coherent play style? This is, again, what I've talked about with between vertical and horizontal progression. Where yes, these are cool new powers, but maybe they're just 
mathematical boosts. Maybe it's just numbers going up, and maybe you haven't really built and told, you know, a, a good subclass will kind of direct, gently guide the player as to what they're supposed to be doing when they play this that will fulfill the fantasy and also be fun to play and work with the game mechanics that have been provided. And then at the top, at 11th and 17th level, you have a choose your own ability feature. I love these, so um, I, I have much less to say against these. And of course, at 17th level, um, you get to, to pick two. Um, so awesome. Um, that's that's actually that's actually cool. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna touch on those too much. Um, but so let's just go through it. So the first thing you're gonna get is serpent style. You get proficiency in pole arms, and they're gonna you're able to gonna gonna be able to give them reach if they don't have reach. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just it. You get pole arms. Now for your average monk, this is just gonna be normally you've got your quarter staff. That's a monk weapon for you, and so normally that was a D8. And now you can use ooh, a pike or a halberd or a glaive instead. Now it's a d10. Okay, cool. Plus one damage bonus on all my attacks. Okay, that's uh, that's all right as a monk. That's not bad. Reach, however, has a problem. When we look at the monk gameplay loop, your average monk is going to walk in to combat, attack with their d8 uh, quarter staff or spear, and then they would bonus action unarm strike or bonus action flurry of blows. Let's say, okay, now we can give those uh, weapons reach. Cool. So you walk in, uh, not close to 5 feet, you only go out to 10 feet, and you attack with your reach weapon. And what are you doing with your bonus action? Because your martial arts do not have reach, and your Floria blows do not have reach. So now you're left with this bonus action and nothing to do. So I guess you could walk up and now use your unarmed strike and your warrior Floria blows as your bonus action. But now you've pretty much gotten rid of the reach property. So the whole point of, of getting a reach weapon has been invalidated by this design decision. And that just feels bad. Uh, the whole point of the monk was that monks aren't very mobile. They, they are very mobile. They aren't very sur survivable, right? Their AC and their HP are typically pretty low. So it's helpful that they can use a reach weapon to stay out of combat. So um, if, if, if you do give up your bonus action for your no more martial arts, no more flurry of blows, you're taking a serious hit to your damage potential. You get plus one damage because now you're using a D10 weapon instead of a D8. But uh, if, if you're no longer making bonus action attacks in, in the it, as, over the course of the adventuring day, you're probably losing um, maybe 40%, 30, 30 to 40% of all the damage that you're dealing, which is a serious penalty to, to if you want to keep that reach feature. Now, you could just ignore the reach feature, and now you, you've got a plus one damage to, to your weapon attacks, which is very, which is not very impressive at all. But also, also at third level, what you're going to get is um, your jump distances are just always doubled, and then when you step of the wind, instead of normally being doubled, they're instead tripled. And you're going to get advantage on next melee weapon attack. This is this is cool on paper, and it makes sense with the pole vaulting idea. But once we start breaking down the actual numbers, a monk does not probably want to invest too much in strength. So a normal monk is probably going to have eight strength, which means at this level they're going to have an eight foot long jump and they're going to have a two foot high jump. Awful, right? So if they're going to use step of the wind, they're going to double it. Or a serpent monk just always has it doubled. So they're going to have a 16-foot long jump and a 4-foot high jump. Even these numbers are not very good. And this monk is expending resources to, to get there. Now, finally, you're a serpent monk. You're going to get that step of the wind. And so you're going to get that triple jump distance. And what have you got? You've got a 24-foot fo long jump and a 6-foot high jump. How, how good does this sound? Well, once you compare it to just an 18-strength character, has make, made no... 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 They were already investing in strength just to get their weapon attacks, to get their regular gameplay going. So they just incidentally get an 18-foot long jump and a 7-foot high jump. So almost as, as far on the long jump and higher on the high jump. So this, this subclass that is focused on jumping is going to have to spend key to jump not as high as just any regular strength-based fighter, barbarian, paladin, whatever. And that is just embarrassing. And um, so what is this feature? You can use a bonus action to spend a key point to get advantage on an ex-melee weapon attack. Um, is one key worth one instance of advantage on one melee weapon attack? Probably not. Your, your key are more valuable than that. You can stunning strike with them. You can flurry of blows, which is, instead of getting advantage, you just get a whole nother attack, which is more valuable than advantage, by the way. Um, 
So if you wanted to give a jump boost, you should probably just say you can use dexterity instead of strength to calculate your jump distances and make athletic checks regarding jumping. That way, you, you don't have to specifically reference Step of the Wind. It doesn't have to be this long portion. You could just say this instead. As long as you're wielding a uh, weapon with a reach property, you get this bonus. And now you're going to get this 18 strength characters. Uh, whoops. Wow, I jumped way ahead. Sorry. You're going to get this uh, 18 strength characters, 18 foot long jump, and 17 foot, uh, or sorry, 7 foot high jump. You're just going to get that as a default. And if you want a step of the wind, you can get a 36 foot long jump or a 14 foot high jump, which is much more reasonable of a boost. Uh, it's something that's totally practical at level 3, and it is actually, it's it's okay. It's, it's, it's all right. It's going to sometimes come up. Now, this advantage on the next melee weapon attack is fine. You know, I probably wouldn't use it that much. But it's getting, maybe it's getting to the end of the combat and you know you're going to get a short rest afterwards. You might as well get advantage on an attack and that's that's going to feel okay. You know, maybe, oh, now you, you got a crit there. Okay, cool. Uh, I figure this is going to come up pretty rarely. Um, generally, it's just going to be stronger just to make your attacks with your uh, bonus action. Then spend key to get a jump boost. Come on, jump boost. What are we doing? Um... Okay, so now let's look at level 6. So level 3, we haven't really built a coherent playstyle, and the boosts that we do get uh, do kind of conflict with existing playstyles. So what are you going to get at 6th level? At 6th level, you have these situational abilities right here. So the first one is when somebody enters your reach, you can use a reaction to attack it. The second one is whenever it leaves your reach and you make that opportunity attack, you can also use your stunning strike for free, all right, without expending a key point. And the last one is on your turn, you can expend one key to deal an additional 1d6 poison damage and automatically poison the target. This last ability is good. I am not going to go any farther into it than just to say this is good. It's probably, I, I, I personally prefer it over Stunning Strike because Stunning Strike can so often just, they just pass their save and nothing happens. Poisoned is a good debuff. 1d6 damage is, this, this is, this, all this is probably worth a key point, right? It's, it's, it's probably just fine. However, um, when you look at Cobra Strike and Python Strike, sometimes these two will conflict because both of these are a reaction. Secondly, you've been given reach weapons, which means uh, with Python Strike, opportunity attacks, you're not going to take as many opportunity attacks as you normally might because they can move uh, instead of just moving out of out, out of your, your five square reach, they can move out uh, they can move out one square and they won't get that opportunity attack till they move two squares. Right, and uh, let's also keep this in mind that this is not like oh you you automatically hit them and you're automatically going to stun them. No, this is saving one key point. Okay, uh, which how often are creatures provoking these opportunity attacks? How often are they you know, running away from the monk? Usually they're just gonna if if they're right next to you, they're just gonna go to town. Right, they're just gonna bop 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 punch punch the monk until you go down, and you you probably will go down because this monk has not gotten any uh, great defensive boosts. Um, and Cobra Strike, again, it's a uh, user reaction to make one attack. Now, of course, you can spend the key point, do Stunning Strike. But at the same time, this is just, um, uh, this is, this is not, this is not the biggest impact feature. And especially once your reach is, is very big, if you start wading into the, uh, thick of combat, you might incidentally leave, a, you, know, you might go to attack one creature and just by walking up to that creature, another creature's already entered your reach. So... Um, that's just because of how big your reach is. And that is especially true once we get to 11th level. Uh, so overall, uh, Viper Strike, pretty good. Python Strike is eh, and Cobalt Strike is eh. These will come up, but these are also noodly features. They trigger at inconsistent times, which means I think they're going to slow th the game down. And we also, at, for what? We have not built a more coherent play style, more than just the fact that this is a monk that is using a reach weapon, that is caring about when they enter your, the, your reach, when they leave your reach, and, um, you know, just, just, it's, it's, I, I don't find it a very compelling design. At level 11 and 17, we're going to get what's called stances, and this is just basically, you have four options, pick an ability that you like, and you're going to have that always on. So for the Anaconda stance, it's going to increase your reach by an additional 10 feet, which is now creatures that are four squares away. You have this enormous reach bubble, which means that Cobra and Python Strike, which, which care about creatures entering or leaving your reach, Creatures probably just aren't going to enter or leave your reach that much because your reach is so big. It's just this giant bubble where creatures can move around and they don't care. Um, they don't care that your reach is that big. So I actually think Anaconda Stance is, is mostly, it's almost like a gimmick. Like this is this is something that maybe I could see it if, if you're using 
uh, if you're pairing it with the Quattle Stance, uh, which we're going to talk to in just a sec, may, you know, maybe you have a play there. But in general, this is this is just kind of, it's it's almost cartoonish uh, how, how big your reach is at this point. For Black black Mamba, this is a typo here. It's uh, while using the stance, if you ever miss, then you could get one free extra attack uh, on that turn. Okay, numbers are going up, you know, 11th level monks, they do need an offensive boost, but this is not particularly flavorful. Um, it is it is one more attack per turn as a monk, which is okay, but it's also one more attack if you miss, you know, in, on the off chance that you miss. So this is fine, um, not not great. Now, Quattle Stance, this is good. Uh, 11th level monk, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a... Uh, uh, what is it at this level? It's like a 55-foot fly speed, something like that. Yeah, sounds good. Always on. Yeah, so sounds great. Um, and this is nice on a monk because, especially with your reach weapons, you're just going to fly over the battlefield and nobody will be able to reach you and you'll just be able to you know, poke down. So, cool. All right, that's fine. And 11th level, is this kind of early? Yeah, but monks are notoriously notoriously need a, a pretty big boost at 11th level. So I think I think this is totally fair. It's good. And the Maroleth Stance, you can take one reaction on every turn of combat instead of once each round. Now, monks don't have a very consistent bonus action. You might be able to start getting opportunity attacks or attacks as cr creatures enter your reach. Uh, again, these are going to trigger at inconsistent times, so now, again, you're slowing down the game for an ability that is not particularly impressive. I'm referring to the 6th-level feature. Um, so the Maroleth, the Maroleth one is also okay. So once you look at the Supreme Serpent at 17th level, you get two of these stances. And so now you can start combining some of these where you're like, oh, uh, I can combine Coatl and Anaconda. So I can be flying 20 feet off the ground and still attack people down low. Um, or I can you know, combine um, Merilith and, and, um, and Coatl, which means because I'm above the ground, um, creatures can more easily um, enter or leave my reach because I'm, you know, um, if, 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 if your DM runs it like uh, reaches a uh, sphere instead of a cube, then you can have uh, nine squares that you're now threatening whenever a creature enters or leaves, rather than the full, um, uh, normally it's, what is it, 25 squares, normally. If, uh, no, am I wrong on that? Uh, da, 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 da. Whatever, it's, it's something like that. Right, it would have to be twenty-five because it's um, uh, two in either two in each direction plus yourself ends up being a five by five square. Which, like I said, just twenty-five squares is a huge area, and so maybe by flying up with Marilus stance, you'll be able you'll be able to take advantage of Cobra and Python Strike more readily. Um, so, when we look at this, what do we have here? What is this monk? I think we have a concept here where you start from. I want to pull our monk, and you fail to consider the mechanic implications and problems that arise. Most notably, that you're you're now you now have to give up your martial arts bonus action attack or your flurry of blows, either that or you're giving up the reach property, and then you start to layer on more abilities that are like okay okay I can see this I can see how this interacts with pole arms, but it starts not to, it doesn't interact in the way that you exactly want, and it does not build, the a play style. It does not have a, you don't have a notion of like oh I could take such and such feet and be good. Now, you could take Sentinel, and so now whenever a creature enters your reach, you get that opportunity attack, so you get that free stunning strike from um, Python Strike, which is okay, but one feat for just, just getting to use your one feature more frequently. I don't know if that's worth a feat. Maybe you should just bump your decks or bump your bump your whiz. Oh, maybe I could take Polar Master. Now I can use the butt end of my Polearm as a bonus action. Okay, is that really worth it for uh, something that all the other abilities of Polar Master are going to overlap so, so that they're effectively useless uh, when, you know, when you compare it to, um, gosh, what the heck was it called? It wasn't Viper Strike, it wasn't uh, Cobra Strike, yeah, Cobra Strike. And, and uh, so y y you end up, you're like, okay, if I want to make this work, I could take this feat, but then the feat overlaps with a bunch of your other abilities, which means the feat is worth less than it normally would be. Uh, and so, what is the build that you're playing here? What, what, what kind of thing are you building? Uh, what is what is the character going to look like? What is the gameplay going to look like? What right? Um, and I don't think I just don't think it delivers. You need to have a more a better idea as to you, you. You start with a concept. You need to start looking at the mechanics 
more with, with an eye with more scrutiny where you can start to say okay what are maybe some of the problems that this monk might have by giving this ability what are some some weaknesses of the monk that i still haven't addressed here that maybe you could address with feats but i've given enough power elsewhere that you don't have to rely on boosting your dexterity and wisdom so much uh and so that, that that's just the considerations that you have to make when you're a designer um if i had to fix it i think the first thing I would say is focus most on level three. Level three is the most important design space. Um, uh, you have to be careful about dipping problems where somebody might take three levels in another class and get a super powerful ability. So you don't want something that's super powerful, but you want something that's super impactful. Most of the game is played between third level and ninth level or so. That's where most of D&D is played. So you want um, uh, abilities that are going to be impactful. You're probably going to want things that either scale or are going to play into later abilities that you're going to get. And I think the simplest answer to this one is to say that uh, at third level, yeah, you get all those pull arms, great. But also, if you could make an unarmed sh strike as your bonus action with martial arts or flurry of blows, you can replace that with a butt end of your pull arm. So you, you still get to keep that reach, and now the weapon's damage dice is going to go down. Normally it, it was d10 because for a pike, but now because you're using the butt... Um, when you're at third level, it's going to be 1d4, you're going to, and you're going to use your martial arts die. So it'll start with d4, and then it'll go to d6. Now you've got the same damage numbers as a normal uh, monk who's using Flurry of Blows or the bonus action uh, unarmed strike, but you get to still keep that reach benefits. Just something as simple as that. Uh, how about making our, for, for the other ability, how about instead of going from single to double, how about uh, uh, becoming double to triple, instead how about we just focus on improving jumping by using dex and i think that works perfectly it works elegantly and it's going to be impactful it's it's going to um the numbers are good right there um how about some other features right like a lot of uh especially when we look at one D D, the weapon mastery system there's like topple where you can just trip a lot so now you have a cool play built into the subclass where you can step of the wind jump 15 feet in the air and knock somebody out of the air, trip trip them out. Okay, that's that's cool. Now tripping isn't a silver bullet. Like I'm not saying that this is you needed this in the subclass, but you know I I think that fits with uh, Oberyn Martell hamstringing a guy or Shieldbreaker using puncture and, and bringing somebody to the front, uh, making them exposed. Uh, I I think tripping can play into that. Uh, it doesn't work perfectly because in order to get advantage on attacks against prone targets, you need to be within five feet, which is you know, kind of lousy with your reach. So it's it, this is not a silver bullet, but I, I think it's a good representation. Some other debuff, uh, certainly Viper has a, has a good debuff, but is, is there any anything else really that we can imagine using a polearm? I think the obvious way to use a polearm is to trip somebody, right? Trip, trip them up, um, get in their face uh, while you still get to stay away. Um, and when you're looking at further fixes, um, how about for Python Strike, instead of getting a free stunning strike, what if you just did something where you reduced enemy speed? Or maybe if you targeted them and made a bunch of attacks against them, and all of a sudden their speed is zero, and you could just walk away free, and, uh, and now now you're a, a battlefield controller where you're walking around the battlefield and hampering all the opponents. You're going through with your with your spear and, and seizing them up with your you know, as a Python constricts, right? Uh, I think that would be a, a super simple fix that, that would actually be pretty powerful and impactful. Um, at 11th level, the stances, um, Black Ma Ma Mamba and Anaconda are, are real snakes, right? While the other two are Merilith and Coatl, which are um, mythological or fictional. Um, so, uh, And they also kind of read like like upgrades, right? So we ha we already had a Viper Strike, so Black Mamba stance, uh, and now a Black, uh, a Black Mamba is a Viper. And uh, uh, you have the Python strike. Right? Now you have the Anaconda stance. And Anaconda is a Python. Um, I might prefer something a little more mythological, like a Naga serpent. So you'd have like a Naga stance, or maybe an Anathema stance, referencing the Yuan Ti Anathema, or a World Serpent stance. So now you have four uh, mythical creatures, and then you can start to build something more unique at that. Like a, a 11th level monk, it's like, okay, you can attack more, your reach is longer. Uh, oh, you get more reactions. Uh, you know, these might be mechanically all right, but we want something. We want some more pizzazz. Like we want, we want something that's going to, 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 to like something as impactful as the Coatl strike, where you're always, where you can fly, um, and fly very fast and, and just always be flying. Um, you probably want something as good as 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 Coatl and something that's going to sync more with your powers. So that, that that was the purpose of this uh, of these design doctors to really start to dig into what makes a design tick. 
what do you need to consider when you are a designer? What are some failings that you might run into? When I'm a designer, should I just, uh, where, where should I start? And um, ho hopefully by looking at these subclasses, I've been able to peer more into that, give a, a better idea as to what are things that you want to look at, what are some considerations you want to make. Now, some people might be like, oh, Ben, check out these designs, because I do have public as part of my guide to Draconheim. I do have, what is that, some 14 or so subclasses, a couple backgrounds. Uh, if, if you want to come to me and say, Ben, you're not even following your own advice, please, please do. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear feedback. I, I'm always looking for ways to improve. And um, and some of those designs in there, I, I think, could do with a, a lot of improvement. There's some that I'm not particularly sold on. Uh, but but most of them I feel are like good enough. I'm, I'm like this is good enough for me. I, I, I think this is cool. I think this is balanced. I think this is powerful. I, I think it would be interesting to play. Um, so I, I'm not gonna say I stand by all those. I mean I do stand by those, all those designs. But is there room for improvement? Tell me. I'm interested. So um, that's just kind of the exploration I wanted here with these design doctors. Explore design and uh, try it out. Um, show some show some places where we can improve, some things we can learn, and hopefully you've learned something here today too.